Hello, everyone. How lovely to be here. Um, okay. I am. I, I, uh, I'm delighted to be here. I want to share something with you about my journey with autism. Uh, autism wasn't something I knew anything about, really. Rain Man, the movie, something like that. Um, and it has. It's come into my life in a big way. And uh, I'd like to share something about the things it's taught me and the things I've come to love, thanks to autism, thanks to my boy, and thanks to the privilege of meeting so many amazing carers, teachers, and professionals, and particularly my fellow peers uh, that I spend a lot of time with now. I used to look like this for an awfully long time. So 12 years, I think, I shaved my head. I was very cool, obviously. And uh, I hung around in London town. And I think, really, my life was very much about having control. I had a lot of plans. And uh, I used to uh, lecture at Central St. Martin's. I used to work in product design and design generally. And it was all about beautiful spaces and beautiful things and beautiful parties. Uh, and it was, it was a lot of fun. But um, I did, I got to a point in about my 30s where, to be honest, it was feeling a bit vacuous. And uh, I was having a bit of a 30, 30 something thing going, what next? You know? I've got a great home, I've got a great business, I work uh, with very interesting people. Uh, but it was, all, it was very much about commercialism and consumerism and pretty stuff. And uh, I thought, well, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe that whole getting married, having baby thing. I might give it a go, fit it in, chuck out a few kids. And um, I did. And I was fortunate enough that I met my husband. And I had a little girl, followed by a little boy. And it seemed everything was going to plan. Uh, and I think the next slide is, it's a new set of slides I did today. And this is my little boy, when he's probably about one and a half, something like that, maybe a bit older. And something I want to say about autism particularly, I think it's a, it's a sneaky little disability. And you, what I know from uh, my peers is that, you know, you, you bear your child and you think everything's going to plan. Uh, but eventually, for me, this sort of really, a real sense of disease started to sneak in. And it was really early on, it was about eight weeks when eight, you know, eye contact was meant to come and it just wasn't. Um, but I can't tell you just how lonely that period of my life was because I started to sense something was deeply wrong. I couldn't find my boy. Uh, and yet everyone was just calling me postnatal or over anxious or uh, just downright attention seeking and crazy. And so I spent probably two years of my life thinking that my son hated me because if I tried to play with him or interact with him and so on, try and bring on his language because it wasn't happening, uh, he would smash his head. And it was his way of communicating, go away, I can't handle you. And I would uh, retreat and go and tidy up. I had an extremely clean house. So, so that's the first thing I'd like to say about autism. It, it's, it's kind of pernicious in that way. You know, it's a very lonely journey to sort of make that journey to thinking that something's wrong with it. And I think that was the big split between my, me and my then husband was that he couldn't bear to think there was anything wrong with our son. And so he blamed me. He, he wanted it. The problem was me. I'm a crap mum. Uh, and I was actually quite happy to take the blame and take the fault for that. I'd much rather there was something wrong with me and my parenting than, than, than imagine anything was wrong with my beloved boy. But anyway, time, time took a turn, and eventually somebody dared to say, have you ever heard of Asperger's? Have you ever heard of autism? I'm wondering. Um, and it was very, very quick after that that he was diagnosed. So at two and two, he was first, first stage diagnosis. By two and a half, he was fully diagnosed. And he's a, he's a fully fledged autist. He, he scored 14 out of 14. Uh, he doesn't do things lightly, does young Axel. So, on we went. And it, it has, a, it is a love story, it, it, but it, you know, it really was tough. It was tough. You know, I, I had this idea, this plan, this, uh, this thing I was trying to bring about my family. I wanted to be married, three kids. I wanted our arguments to be about where to go skiing. And this really wasn't part of my plan. Um, and so, my life just became wall to wall therapy. So, 
uh, I was lucky enough with my statement to uh, get something called applied behaviour analysis and I became a uh, headmistress for a school for a while. I had uh, six members of staff and we ran a 40 hour a week programme. We had a consultant supervisor and four members of staff doing that. And basically we were trying to uh, massage, you know, trying to stimulate his synapses so that he would speak, so that he would do the things that we do, that we were trying to draw him to be like us. And it was marginally uh, successful, but I think with these things, you know, there's some, there's some amazing therapies out there and some work for some, uh, but I do, I sometimes think that this was like trying to get Axel to grow an extra limb or something. It just wasn't, it just wasn't going to happen. But this is, you can see all the equipment we've got there with all the PEX images and day in, day out, we're trying to get this boy to speak. So we did, we did play therapy, speech and language therapy, uh, occupational therapy, we did all sorts of odd things, cranial, acupressure, uh, on it went. And, uh, you know, my, my little girl all the while, because I had a girl first, she's, she's, uh, she's going, Mummy, can I have a therapy? And uh, wondering where her ton of stuff is. Um, and after a little while, he went to school. You can see just how thrilled he is with his new uniform. And uh, this is some of his wonderful team. And so off he went to school. I was, again, very disappointed in that I thought that I would get my son into a mainstream school with an aide. Uh, and then at least I thought we'd get him into the Asperger's school, but his language wasn't good enough. And so he was awarded a place in what I call a moderate school. And uh, that, that didn't work either. And here he is, my little lad, in his moderate school. And uh, I don't know about you, but I mean, you know, so the neurotypicals, the normal people, they're chatting away over lunch, and he is just lost. And uh, so I've got this little boy who's just lost. He doesn't talk. If I try to interact or play with him, he hurts himself. He will not look at me. He will not allow me to hold him. Uh, in fact, if he does hurt himself, the best thing I can do is go away. Because what I eventually came to understand, it wasn't that he hated me. It was that he found me so arousing that his synapses, his signals would go crazy. And so not only is he experiencing pain, but he's trying to deal with me too. And it was all too much. So for me to actually exit as long as he's safe was the best thing to do. Things got worse. And I found myself finding that actually in this school he was sliding backwards. So things were getting even worse. And so I then found myself practically going to tribunal arguing with the teachers to get him out and into what I call a severe school. He went to the severe school, it got worse, I argued, and I found the hardest part of this journey was traveling the country looking for a residential school for a seven-year-old boy. At this time, having this level of severity has its advantages, and I had help being thrown at me, thankfully, from pretty much all angles, and this is Heather, one of our many, many carers. I think we probably had about 50 carers come through the house. Uh, and they basically helped me to keep him safe. He's so, he's such an interesting mixture of things. Completely, I've just looked, when I will be back. Um, he's, uh, he's clever enough to escape the house and run off down the road, but not safe enough to cross the road. There's this strange mix of, of brilliance and mischief. And, and utterly, utterly dangerous. Uh, so I did I had more and more carers coming into the house and I started to be offered respite, which meant my son was leaving the home and living elsewhere seven nights a month. And things still got really worse. Axel's autism is very severe, you may know something about it. I've done other talks which are on YouTube called You Can Talk. Um, and they define the, the sort of, you know, what autism's about. So if you want to learn more about that, that's there. But it's basically a triad of impairments. It's an extremely interesting disability and it impacts individuals in a very, very unique and variety of ways. They talk about spectrums, they talk about high functioning, low functioning. I quite like the idea of a constellation. And so it's basically like we are all very different and we're all, you know, we have different skills. So he has this triad of impairments, which is what autism is, and it's around social communication, how we speak. How we, how we communicate, so I might look at you and nod like that, you know I'm suggesting we go out. It's all those subtle things we do. Flirting is another social communication that can be hard for an autist to master. Uh, and imagination or empathy or play can also be 
uh, challenged. The other thing, though, for a lot of autists that's now uh, recognised is that they have sensory impairments or sensory difficulties, and this can mean that they are either uh, super sensitive or really not. Uh, and Axel's sensitivities mean that some very, very basic things we do are petrifying for him. Uh, and he can find uh, changes in routine and uh, transitioning from one activity or place to another very, very upsetting. Um, and we've done a lot of work on hairdressing and I can happily say that we actually managed our first trip to the barbers recently. Uh, by contrast, if you've got a wibbly tooth, you just rip it out. Yeah, absolutely. He can fall off a trampoline, bang his head, all of it, absolutely no problem at all. The boy does not feel uh, these things very well, but that also has its own challenges because it means he does not feel a boiling hot bath. So despite being lobster red, uh, he's, he's not aware that he is getting way too hot. As if the autism wasn't enough. Uh, the poor lad had uh, head-to-toe eczema, which uh, also uh, had loads of infections and so on. <laughs> Before I move on to this, he also has asthma. So we've had the joy of being blue-lighted to hospital, uh, which is jolly exciting. This is the sort of mischief this boy gets up to. So he's got a passion for flour. Uh, you can decorate with it, you can eat it, obviously. Uh, so it's a snack and a toy. This top right hand one, double whammy, he uh, threw his father's phone inside the car and broke the screen and the phone. The bottom right one actually isn't very clear, but it's, it's actually the biting and the scratching that started. He used to bang his head on the mirror if I didn't pay attention. It broke. That's a five foot square mirror. This one is uh, one of many flat screen TVs. I actually shifted to video players because they're a bit cheaper and more robust. And just more biting. And more biting. This one was funny. <laughs> so the scaffolder said, nah, nah, that thing will never get up there. I think it took him at least three minutes to work that out. <laughs> Um, and up he shimmied. And the irony of this is that uh, all the windows are bolted. Everything is like Fort Knox in our house because he does escape and run away. He thinks that's very funny. And uh, so I couldn't actually get out to, I couldn't find any of the keys because I hide the keys because he notices where I hide them. So then I hide them in more clever places and then of course I forget where that clever place was. So I couldn't. And here I am covering the trampoline to stop him from jumping. Uh, I, I don't know whether he really would, but I wasn't about to, uh, to, to find out. Impact on siblings, so sister. Impact on siblings is huge, and uh, the stuff I'm currently reading about siblings is, is upsetting. Uh, so I have now trained to be a sibling group leader, uh, and will be attempting to do something to address that. An impact on families, of course. A child like this, more than anything, needs a family to stay together, and yet 87% of them don't. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's harrowing. <laughs> I'm going to cry at my own talk. Um, and of course this. Yeah, um, my, my life. What happened to my life? So I no longer was a designer and a manufacturer and a maker and a whatever. I was very much a, a woman at home now, divorcing two kids, and Axel's routine at this time was to be awake at about two or four o'clock in the morning for the day. And I got very good at cooking the evening meal at that hour, and uh, we did baths and things like that to try and keep him quiet to sort of not wake up the rest of the house. Serenity prayer. This was big for me. So God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. I got to a place where, I guess Axel was probably about nine, and I was living in this very strange twilight world, and very lonely, and uh, dealing with a great deal of violence, and so on. And what was really happening at this time is that I was losing my carers. They were getting so badly bitten and maimed, they were leaving. And so without support, I couldn't keep my son home. So probably the worst day of my life was going into a meeting and saying, it's time, he went. And my little boy, at the age of 10, left home and went into a care home. 
And that is up there, I think, as, as worst things you can do. Packing his little boy clothes to go to a care home is not like a skiing holiday or a, or a university or something. But it is what needed to happen. And love, I really get, sometimes means to let go. And the idea that you need a village to raise a child with Axel, you needed a small army. So I sent him to the place which had a small army that could really meet his needs, keep him safe, take him out and uh, teach him. And it did, it, it brought sanity to our lives. It meant that actually now Axel comes home Monday to Wednesday. Uh, and it means I get to love him two days a week and then I can spend time with my daughter and work. And this funny world has brought me a lot. This was a game changer. Oh God, I need to hurry up. Um, we found out that actually he was incredibly allergic to food, all sorts of food, so gluten, dairy, all that sort of stuff. And so he had these horrible tests done on him, but they were absolutely revolutionary. And having changed his diet, he is so much calmer and happier, he can sleep, he can concentrate. So I am so pleased for him. I'm sad it took us so long to find out. And I have uh, got back to work. I actually uh, work as a shadow work coach. I do one-to-ones, I work with couples. And this is uh, some of the people in my parents' support group. And they are such an amazing bunch of people, I think. The whole idea of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, teaches you, makes you uh, more aware. Um, a more loving and committed group of people I don't think I've had the privilege of knowing. And this is quite unbelievable, who knew? I, um, <clears throat> I teach teaching parents to teach their kids to masturbate. And uh, I can tell you it's a jolly uncomfortable subject to uh, be involved in. But, you know, children like mine are not chatting to their mates, they're not reading magazines, they're not online, and it, uh, it, it uncomfortably became a thing that I realised I needed to support. So, having done that, and it's an awkward thing to talk about, isn't it? Being successful. <laughs> I now support other people to be successful. Marvellous, who knew parenting would be so lovely. So, you, I mean, what I'm trying to, I guess, bring here is, I don't, you know, I don't want to concentrate too much on the journey, but it, it's, it's important. There's something about, you know, autism disability for me was always something very scary, very ugly, very unwanted, you know, over there. Um, and it has, it's come flying into my life. I've had to address it and face it and be with it. And uh, I, I think it's, it's just taught me so much. Uh, and, and now... You know, I, I, I've come to really love autism, I love my son, and, and I love what I've come to learn. Um, and I think for so long I hated it, and I was really grieving the life I'd lost and the expectations I had. And I get that it, it, it came about when I actually stopped grieving what I thought I was due, and started to accept, turn towards, uh, uh, and love what I had, and get behind it, that my life, and everyone in my in environment, uh, became an awful lot more fun. Uh, I remember saying to my daughter once, uh, I mean, Anusha, what mother wants to visit their child in a care home? To which she said, I don't know, mum, uh, a mother whose child is in a care home? <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> so right, so right. Yes, I do. Yes, I do want to go and visit in a care home. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and that is it, isn't it? A successful life isn't necessarily about what you're putting out there, it's about how you uh, acknowledge, accept and deal with what's dealt to you. So some of the things that I have learned, oh, this is my uh, Facebook page that I would love all of you to join and um, learn more about him and us. Um, this, every criticism, judgment, diagnosis and expression of anger is the tragic expression of an unmet need. Now it might seem like a funny thing to be grateful for, but when you've got a child coming in every single day who's smashing up the place and biting, it gives you a daily practice in meeting anger with love. Because that is what he needs. His anger is a tragic expression of an unmet need. So when he's in that space, what does he need from me? How can I bring him back to himself? I love this one too. Love me when I least deserve it. That's when I really need it. I know that's true for me. And there is, there's another one I was trying to find today, which was about, uh, you know, what is love? Loving someone is uh, singing, was it singing to them the song in their heart when they've forgotten it? And in those moments when Axel still to this day has these awful meltdowns, uh, it's about singing to him, to bring him back to his 
beautiful self. <laughs> the other thing I've really got good at is dealing with the public. Right. You can't help it. If you go out with an actor, it's like the circus is coming. Here we go. And uh, so often he's in such a bad place. I have to. I still have to use trolleys. So he's way too big uh, for trolleys. But in he goes. And obviously the public, uh, for me, is mainly in three categories. You've got the adorable. So the adorable are the ones who help out or back off or make space, whatever, let you go first. Uh, and then you've got the ambivalence who sort of click and touch and look and stare or whatever. And they've got the downright ugly. And uh, sadly we have. We've had people come steaming over and spit disgusting in my face. And um, I was so perplexed I didn't have a chance to go have a chat. Um, but uh, they often, in this scenario, it's happened so many times, I've, I've got prepared for it, and they come over and go, do you know what you're doing? And I go, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I have a bit of fun with it now. And even the police coming round because of the noise. But, you know, what I, what I also get is there's love there too. And I love these people because what I get is that it's awkward and they're challenged, but it does look nuts. They, they're questioning my sanity and what I'm doing. And, and I actually have come to really like people who bother to come and challenge me and, and check that everything's okay, even if it's done badly. This is a funny one. I just want to share this with you very quickly because um, it's about expectations and love is about patience and about staying there and not forcing and not pushing. And uh, with Axel, you know, I do all sorts of stuff with him. I mean, I've never seen a child in a... He was in an egg and spoon race with a beanbag on his head, going in and out of cones, being told to go faster than the other kid. I mean, explain that. And I do, I laugh at how we're normal, and my little lad is having to do this mental stuff we, we put them through. But whether it's Christmas, we wrap stuff up and then we unwrap it, and we, we, we've got so many strange rituals that, you know, it really, really makes me question who's, who's the nuts one. Um, and this was an exceptionally wonderful thing where uh, it had been a really rubbish day. It was Axel's birthday, and Axel's birthday is always a bit sad for me. And I, I just sort of, I'd lost the will to push with it. And I hadn't bothered with the cake, and I hadn't done the candles, and I hadn't, I just, I just, I was giving up. And I just wanted him to go to bed. I wanted to just go to bed myself. And so I was trying to get him to go to sleep in the lounge, which is where he slept for five years. Um, and he would not settle. And I thought, what is going on? And he's pointing, pointing, pointing to the mantelpiece. And I was like, what? And so he came, I said, show me, show me. And so we went to the mantelpiece, and he's pointing at the candles. And I went, really? So I lit the candles, and then his little face, he's looking at me. And I thought, really? Could it be? For 14 years I've done this crazy ritual that I have no idea you have any perception of, or birthday. Uh, and I sang to him. Lord went and blew out all the candles, he giggled to himself and went to bed. And it's like, how? Who is? And so a real education to me of never give up, never stop trying, keep doing our stuff. Uh, you never know quite what's going in there. I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set it free. This for me is about my arrogance towards my son. Like I'm Michelangelo and I'm trying to carve this stuck angel out so he can be with us, like us. What a load of rubbish. I've come to think that actually I'm stuck in the marble. He is so free. He is free of all our social constraints and ideas and so on. He is free. I'm the one who's trapped in marble of shoulds and coulds and wouldn'ts. I'm going to move on from this because I really am running over. Um, this is really, I adore this child. And at the point I stopped, as I say, being upset and expectations and things and just be with him, I have never met anyone so honest or authentic in my life. And if Axel doesn't want you in the room, he will just very sweetly take your hand, take you to the door, put you outside and shut it. <laughs> no malice, no ugliness, just he's had enough. And I, I've really tried to sort of model how he is because he's, he's really straightforward. There's no energy in it. I love it. And I think about how we tie ourselves up in knots by lying to each other because we think that's a clever thing to do. And I love his spontaneity and his freedom. So if he fancies out of nowhere to have a little run up and down by the frozen pea section and have a whoop, then he will. 
And if it's a very hot day and you are wanting to cool down, then you lie down and put your face on the tiles because they're chilly. And I do, I just, I just sometimes wonder, what would you love to have said? What would you really like to be doing with your life uh, if you were free? And, and as I say, in so many ways, he's not free, he's dangerous, he needs our love and support to keep him safe. But in some really profound and beautiful ways, he is really free. This was a funny one. This is the first time I've ever had a valentine or anything from my little man. Uh, and obviously it was an activity at school, so they got him to colour it in and they got him to write these words. And these words said, you know, to mummy, it's very funny, to mummy, I love you from Axel. And it was a very strange experience for me, because, and I, I sobbed, absolutely sobbed. It was the first time I've ever seen those words, obviously I've never heard them, and I realised how much of this life journey I have committed to him, how much I love him, uh, but with no expectation of return. I will love him biting me, I will love him is everything. Uh, but I really got to a place of accepting that I felt it would never come back. I would never know how he felt about me. And then this strange ritual of ours uh, and him being made to do it. And I was thinking, how would I know? And so it's not about flowers and champagne and boxes of chocolates and so on. And I started to really think, does my son love me? And I thought, you know what, he really does. And in some of the most important of ways, and these days he will look me in the eye, and I don't know if you know how precious that is. Uh, it's always a bit strange, isn't it, looking people in the eye? But when you haven't had it and then you get it, you realise just how beautiful eye contact is, let alone touching. There was a long period of time where I would tie my son's shoelaces just to be close to him, uh, or I would try and touch his knee under the dinner table just to get knee-to-knee -knee touch, but immediately he would move it. And these days he does this. And so there, there is something very magical about him. And when he uh, accepts you, when he feels safe with you, when he comes and looks at you and is with you, I can't really put it into words, like I couldn't explain the early days with him, but there's something very, very mysterious and very, very beautiful about these children, these people. And if I do, I recommend if you have the privilege or opportunity to be near one, with one, uh, be curious if you're not already. And I finish this. I don't know if you know the song. Uh, Nat King Cole sings it. It's called Nature Boy. And I love this song. I've always loved this song. But I didn't realise just how perfect it was for, for my life. So I finish with this. I think I know it off by heart, but in case. There was a boy, a very strange, enchanted boy, they say he wandered very far, very far, over land and sea. A little shy and sad of eye, but very wise was he. And then one day, one magic day, he passed my way. <laughs> Excuse me. And while we spoke of many things, of fools and kings, this he said to me, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. And I feel that I have been really privileged to have Axel come into my life and I feel that he has given me one of the wonderful educations about what does love really mean and uh, what it is like to be loved by him. Thank you. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Kath. I, I've heard Kath give that talk once before. She came to uh, Eastport to the Vavar there and gave it. And, and, uh, and so I'm delighted that she's come to share that with us in Hastings and St. Ennis. Now, um, does anybody have any questions for okay. Kath? I'm going to come up here because I can see some hands up here. I'm going to come. Right. Why do you call it a disability? Because I have an autistic son, I would say it's a gift because he's shown me things like understanding, compassion, and seeing things in another way that I would never ever see before. I would never see my child's autism as a, as a disability. So I'm curious to, say, to understand why you actually use that term. 
I would now totally agree with you. So in the beginning, when Axel's condition or gift uh, was impacting him, his world was awful. And so actually the reason I started writing on Facebook was because I was angry with the Autism Sparkles, Autism Shines, Autism is a Gift pages, because it wasn't in any way describing the part of the spectrum or the construct, whatever you want to call it, that we were living in. And so whilst autism may be a gift for some, and there may be savants and genius, or even this lovely, for a lot of autists, and I work with a lot of those parents, it is miserable. So I think, you know, there's a, there's a you know, if it can be a discipline, as in really profoundly disabling in terms of society, what you can do functionally. Uh, it can be a condition, it can just be a quirk, a, a thing that you manage, and for a lot of people with Asperger's, uh, it's still quite hard. Uh, the rate of suicide is very high in that category, it's not easy. Uh, and then for some, you know, and I think even with Axel, I think he's in a good place now. But there are still times where his frustrations mean he's, he's close to breaking his limbs. And that's, that's not a gift. So it's, it's a big conversation, that one. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, any other questions for Kevin? Just I'm wondering around. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, down here. Hi. Uh, when did he start to become happy? And why do you think that was? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I think, so before, he, he, he was ingesting a lot of very toxic foods that were toxic to his system. Yeah? And, and so there's like eight things, major, major food types that we've removed from his diet, and it's been a game changer. So he was in agony every day before, and that was really impacting him in every way. Uh, so the diet has been massive for him. I also think that he's got such a strong, rigid set around him of people that using ways to communicate, he feels safer, so he's calmer. Um, and I mean, between you and me, I think masturbating is massively helpful. So, so you know, <laughs> it's <laughs> nature's, <laughs> nature's wonderful, <laughs> you know, it, and it is, really. It's we all helpful. concur with that. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, I saw a hand over here, so excellent, yeah. How, how do you see his future developing? So how? How do you see his future developing? Hey, future. Uh, yeah, that's one subject that really scares a lot of parents. Um, I've done a lot of work around that, and my hope for him is that he will be in some sort of supported living scenario. So there'll be two or three adults with a similar diagnosis. Uh, with supporting adults to help them to live there. I hope it's locked. Um, I don't know, for the first time ever at a meeting recently, our new social worker said, um, have you guys started to think about any voluntary work for him? Which was, you know, I almost wanted to cry. The, you know, the, 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 he's developed so well lately. Um, the, the, the thought of that is, is magical. And... Uh, Sadly, his headmaster said, well, you know, 97% of autists don't work. And I thought, yeah, it doesn't have to be like that, does it? So I don't know. I'm keeping a very open heart, very open mind, and a, a realistic one. Uh, and I hope we can, you know, push boundaries as much as we can. Brilliant. Some very big and profound questions. But it's a very, very big and profound talk that you've So well, are there any... I'll take one last question, and then we'll, then we'll have a break. If there, oh, there's someone... But, yes. Um, hi, yeah, I just want to say, um, as an autistic person myself, it's interesting seeing the other side of things. Um, yeah. You were talking about sort of his future, and um, it's just a case of, have you found any sort of special interest for him? Because I found, like, with my sort of photography, that was a major special interest for me. My parents have sort of really invested in that, and I'm at the point where I can sort of volunteer for places like that. I was wondering if you'd found anything similar for him. It's a wonderful question, and it has been a real problem, because no was was the thing so for absolutely ages we couldn't we, we bought everything and tried everything and nothing seemed to attract him um, however in recent times I mean I've been through cooking with him and boating with him and climbing I mean honestly I've been everywhere um, uh, but 
he really does seem to be having a, a love for music. And so I've started taking him to pubs to see bands. Uh, yeah, which sometimes he's noisier than the band, but you know. Uh, we get through. Um, and he... So he, he really deeply lives, listens to music. There's something quite magical that happens there. And I'm about to... Oh, I can't believe we're doing this. I'm buying a piano. And he's got piano lessons going, I don't know what that's going to do, but we're going we're gonna to see if a uh, musical instrument might. He says, I'll give it a go. Yeah. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much.